Thank you. So uh, I would like today to just uh, first spend five minutes on the last thing I, I talked about last time and I didn't have to finish, uh, which was about the um, learning in, uh, that was about learning in recurrent network. So learning low, dimension, low dimensional manifold in RNN. So it was a, so it's it's a, it's a big subject, but I had a very specific uh, definition for that, uh, which was inspired from from your science, if you remember. So the idea was to, uh, to see it was actually to see how. M so as I told you, I mean there have been these discoveries in the 70s of place cells in the hippocampus, which are cells which are neurons which fire when an animal is at a given position in an environment. So the question which is interesting is how many environments which are thought as let's say two-dimensional maps, a single recurrent neural network can actually embed. And the way I define that, and I just want to, to comment on this and give the results, because I, I promised it, was uh, suppose, for instance, you take a two-dimensional manifold, which is for me just a unit square, so it's a very simple uh, uh, manifold. I, will, I have n neurons. And essentially, what uh, what I'm doing is that I, I will just throw uh, uh, throw randomly um, some points which correspond to the centers of the place fields of the neurons. So, for instance, neuron number I will be centered here, and then I draw a disk with peri periodic boundary conditions, just to make my life a little bit simple. What is the box? Is that the space? Or? Sorry. What is the box? Is that the space? Yes. So this is this is Im imagine the animal is moving in a one by one square which is actually pretty much what, uh, what rats are doing in the experiments, right? Um, one bin, one meter, for instance. Okay, so you have this, uh, so there are disks here of the same size around these points. And of course, these disks may, be, may overlap. So each disk is occupying a, 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 a fraction of this, uh, of this square here, which is experimentally of the order of, of 20%, typically. So that means this is, when the animal is moving in the environment, this cell is actually going to be inactive whenever the animal is outside the disk, and when it's inside the disk, then it will fire. Okay, just an approximation of reality. And then what I will do, so I do that for, for, the, first, uh, for the first manifold, and then what I do is that I will now throw randomly some other position, which are the positions of the animal, so this is my first dot here. And then I, I will look at how many disks actually this position is falling, right? So here, it could fall only on that one, in, in this one. So the corresponding neuron, which is, let's say, neuron number 10, is going to be active. So I define, for this point here, a first pattern of activity, which is this xi. This is a superscript, which is going to be a set of 1 and zeros, And all the neurons which have place fields, are, uh, including this, this uh, uh, pink dot, will be active. So in particular, neuron number 10 will be active, and the other ones will be inactive, and so on. There might be another one which is active somewhere, and so on. OK? And then I'm doing that for another point here, which is maybe this small square, and you will have another pattern, which is a set of zeros on one. Zeros, one, one, zeros, uh, I don't know, whatever. And you do that many times, right? And I, my parameter will be p, so here is another one, and p is the number of points and it's interesting to have large p but of the order one because p is controlling actually the typical distance between the nearest neighbors, right? So essentially um, p times the distance epsilon here to the d the dimension of a manifold, which is d equal to in this case. This is covering the whole space, so this is 1. Right? So that gives epsilon as a function of p. So by throwing more points here, I have a smaller epsilon. And this is going to, to be the spatial resolution of my quasi-continuous attractor, because now I'm asking my network to uh, memorize this, these patterns of activity. So the dynamics of the network is the usual dynamics, very simple sign of some of the j, j i j, x j of t. 
you start from some initial condition, and I would like that these patterns here are actually fixed. Uh, sorry, that was with plus or minus one, so here I can put a theta here. And I would like the, so it's a heavy side function, and I would like these patterns of activity to be fixed points of the dynamics, right? So that means that I'm ensuring that there will be a lot of fixed points here. So it's not, so my goal would have to have a complete continuous attractor, but it's a bit difficult, so I, I'm just ha having a, a quasi, I, I, it's a quasi continuous, it's a discretized version, but when epsilon gets small, then you would expect that actually it's a pretty good approximation of a continuous attractor, right? No, no, no. So the size are the data, and I would like this equation to be satisfied. So, and I would like to find fixed points. I would like the the, the, the size to be fixed points of the dynamics. So I would like, for instance, for the psi i to be theta of some of the j, j i j. And actually, I can put some some threshold here. Well, no, we can leave it this way. Um, sorry, that is bad. Okay, so no, that, that's good, that's the way it is, okay. Um, so I would like something like that, right? So if uh, psi i is positive, then that means the argument should be positive, and if it's zero, the argument should be negative, right? And that actually is, gives you a set of inequalities to satisfy, so that should be true for the dot pattern, but also for the square, for the cross, and all, all the other ones, right? So if you do that, it's a single manifold. But now imagine you have another manifold here. You, you take the same neurons, but you put the disks. So neuron 10 was here in this uh, manifold, but now it's maybe in the corner here, right? And you do that again, and you throw other points here. You generate other patterns, OK? And you do that many, many times, and you ask how many such attractors, or quasi-continuous uh, attractors, I can memorize in, in my network, right? So that means you want to satisfy this condition with the same jij here for many l's and mu, where l runs from 1 to p. This is the number of points in one manifold. And mu runs from 1 to l, which is the number of manifolds. OK? And they are all drawn in this way. So this problem can be solved uh, efficiently numerically. It's, it's just a super, uh, using support vector machines algorithms. You know, it's just a perceptron problem. So you can find the best JIJ, which is maximizing the stability I introduced last time. OK, so numerically, you can see when, actually, this, uh, when you exceed the number of constraints and there is no solution anymore, right? So, the, so using the replica approach, and I will stop here. So th the interesting question is, what is the trade-off between L, which is the maximum number of manifolds, let's say, you, you want to store. So there should be some capacity, alpha, which is a ratio L over N. So we have to know what is the maximum alpha you can reach when N goes to infinity and L goes to infinity, which is the best ratio. And that should depend on epsilon, right? So because if F epsilon gets small, that means you want a very uh, flat manifold, and you would expect that the capacity is going to decrease. When epsilon is larger, then you have actually not very nice, but let's say rough maps here, then you would expect that alpha is larger, right? So what is the trade-off between the quality and the quantity of maps that you can store in your, in your recurrent neural network? So, so why doesn't this depend on P also? Yeah, so epsilon and P are the same thing, right? Ah, sorry, yes, yes. So it's a function of P if you prefer, right? OK, so, and so using the replica approach, so I actually have a, a few slides containing uh, some details about that that Anna was very kind to put on Slack. Um, you can show that the capacity, this maximal capacity, is a function of, of epsilon, or p if you prefer, that's, which decays, um, actually it's a constant, c of d, which depends on the dimension, over the log of p uh, to the d. So as you increase p, you decrease epsilon, and the capacity decreases very slowly with p. Um, so that's a result we could derive with the replica approach, uh, which seems to be in very good agreement with the numerics. I mean, of course, we cannot go to huge p's, but p a few hundreds, and that could do that for n equal a few thousands, and so on. 
Okay, so I just wanted to say that because I didn't have time uh, in the first lecture. Is it okay? Is there any way to corroborate this against data, like have some rough estimated number of neurons in, in the brain and number of maps it, it stores and so alpha? Okay, so, so you know n. Um, so, okay, so epsilon in reality, I think this is not so well defined in the sense that, you know, the epsilon probably which is by which animals are encoding uh, maps probably is, is very non-homogeneous uh, uh, across space. So some spots are extremely important, and you can see an accumulation of place fields around some spots, while uh, other ones are much more void of, of any uh, place cells, right? So here it's a, it's a completely homogeneous thing, so... Um, but then, of course, we have no idea in reality of what is the maximum number of manifolds. So the, the most uh, impressive experiment which has been done was done by the Moses and Moses, and they were able to find uh, L equal 11. But just because they got bored by doing more, more rooms and more environments, but that doesn't mean that the rat was not able to do more, right? Uh, with N equal to a few hundred of thousand. But probably the, the animal was able to do much more than that. Okay, so now I would like to, to to go to what uh, to, to the last lecture, and uh, one, yes, um, can these kind of models do like velocity integration, not just store the places but update the places with velocity? Input? Yes. Okay. So here in this version, it doesn't do anything like that. Uh, but of, of of course, if you want to do, I mean, this has been studied a lot. So th there are different versions of model that can do that. So especially, I think the most interesting case, to my knowledge, is the paper which was done. Um, so, uh, so it's a paper uh, by, th by the uh, Janelia group uh, who discovered the uh, ring attractor in, in the ellipsoid body of flies uh, a few years ago. I think I, I talked about that with some, some of you. Um, so th there was a paper in Science, 2000, I don't remember exactly, 16, 17, I have to check, 15. And they had a paper in PLOS uh, CB where they actually uh, did a model to do that. So the idea here is not uh, a motion on a 2D attractor, but it's a motion of on a 1D attractor, which codes for the, uh, the angle of the head of the animal with respect to its body. Uh, and there you can see really, uh, with measurements, you can really uh, analyze the kind of networks which is responsible to do the integration and how it works. So essentially you have a circle, a ring of, of neurons which, whose activity codes for the angles and this, this part is moving. And you have so, uh, so two other rings of neurons which are code for shifts uh, uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise. So there have been a, I think it's a beautiful model which is able to do that. But here we don't do anything uh, so sophisticated, right? Okay, so, um, so in the last uh, lecture, I would like to talk about uh, um, restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, so, and I think maybe one simple way to introduce this machine, probably that most or and maybe everybody knows here probably, is to go back to the beginning of, uh, of the third lecture when I talk about how to infer one direction in a high dimensional space. So if you remember, I'm, I'm using the same notation, I look at the case where we had some uh, probability or density of probability over some uh, n-dimensional vector. And this distribution was uh, up to a normalization constant given by the uh, Gaussian part, which is just exponential minus x squared over 2. So independent units with um, components with uh, uh, variance 1 and centered, plus some biasing function, phi of b dot x, where phi was some potential, and b one specific direction in the n-dimensional space. So for instance, phi of u, of u, if you remember, we looked at different examples. It could be a over 2u squared, so a quadratic function of u, which is a very important case because then you get um, a Gaussian distribution. But you can imagine that you do not center it. You can imagine that you have non-analytic terms. You can imagine you have a high order terms, whatever you, you can think of, right, which leads to a, a well-defined distribution. OK, so, um, so let me rewrite. Uh, the uh, terms which is biasing here the distribution in along B in the following way, which is just a technical trick. The exponential of phi 
I can always, or at least for a large family of, uh, of phi, phi function, write it as an integral over some variable h of exponential h u minus some function u of h. So for many function phi, I will be able to find a function u such that this is going to be true. And the integral runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. So for instance, a very simple example is when phi of u is equal to u squared, right? You know, if you take phi of u equal to u squared, then you see that you can do that with u of h, which is simply also a parabolic function, so it's simply a quadratic function, so it's going to be h squared over 2a. I mean, there is uh, an additive normalization here in the, in the exponential, right? But I don't, I don't care about that. OK? So what does that mean? And what's the interest of doing that? So far, I have just introduced one more variable. It doesn't sound very useful. OK, so if I do that, actually, I have now a model which is, has some kind of um, network or neural net uh, architecture. So I can imagine that I have uh, uh, two layers. One of the first layer will include all the units, xi, with i running from 1 to n. On my second layer, we have a single unit, which is h. And there will be connections here between the units, between this uh, unit here and the other ones, and no connection within the excise, between the excise. And uh, so what is going on on the excise? So I have a local term here, some kind of local potential which is acting on the xi, which is xi squared over 2. So when I write it, I mean that I see it as an energy, which means that there will be a term in the probability which is going to be of this exponential minus v energy. And that you get exactly for all the, all the uh, components of, of the vector x. Similarly, I will have also potential acting on this h, which is u of h, which is responsible for the term exponential minus u of h. And in between, I have interesting terms, which are the couplings here, which I will call, so this is a coupling bi. Uh, and these couplings are responsible for the term exponential h, sum over i bi xi here, that you see here, when you replace u by the dot product between b and x. OK? So this model defines a joint probability distribution for x and h, which is given by, well, I mean, proportional to exponential minus sum over i xi squared over 2 minus u of h plus h sum over i bi xi. OK, so, um, so in, in the following, I will just drop the notation bi, which I, I just used because it was similar to what I did in lecture three. But the standard notation for, for the b's, for the weights, there are wi's. Is it OK? So I just changed notation for formally b, right? So these systems here are the weights of the connection responsible for the interaction between the visible unit here, and what people call the hidden or the latent, which is the same thing, unit. So visible because they are part of the data, and, and this one, it, it just uh, actually appeared through this trick here. No, but I don't care so much. I mean, here I don't care so much. I mean, you, you have a huge family. What I, I'm going really to consider is the u of h, right? So in fact, instead of asking the question whether for any phi I can find a u of h, when we do the training, I will come to this. We really have a family of u of h, and then, then it will define a family uh, of, of phi of h, right? I don't, it, anyway, I mean, we, we will work with the limited family of u of h so, uh, when we train on real data. OK, so uh, sorry. 
Yes, so the, you, there are some limitations on fire. I agree. OK, so now um, the question is, um, so this is a simple example of a restricted Boltzmann machine. And a restricted Boltzmann machine is just a model over the variables. Here you have two sets of variables, these visible units and the hidden units, which interact uh, on this bipartite graph. So no interaction within the visible units and within the hidden units. Uh, so here I have a single hidden unit, but you see it can be extended very easily to any kind of, uh, any number of hidden units, right? I could have more than one if I had more than one direction here, which is uh, an obvious extension you can do, right? So an extension, you can extend to m larger uh, than one, or let's say two hidden units, whatever. What you do is simply you, you, you will have p of x and h, so I will drop the arrows here, but of course this is n-dimensional here, vector, and this is m-dimensional. Then it's going to be exponential minus some of the i, and here I have a, a potential which is a quadratic potential, but it could be another kind of potential acting on the visible unit xi minus the sum of a mu, and the mu here runs from 1 to capital M, u mu h mu, and then you will have an interaction here over, with some of the old pairs of i mu, w i mu, which is the coupling between the, I will write mu i, the coupling between the hidden unit mu and the visible unit i, h mu x i. Okay? And this is the general form of the, of the uh, resistive Boltzmann machine. And you know, the, the network is simply, you have another one here with other connections, seeing the same visible units, and you have M of them. Okay, so it's a model which is actually pretty old. It was introduced um, at, in, the mid, in the mid 80s. Um, at the same time as the uh, Boltzmann machines, 85, 86. So it's not a deep network at all. It's a very shallow one. Um, so, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting for several reasons. It's, it's really interesting because it has deep connection with model and statistical mechanics. So um, that's, a, that's a, a reason, which is also a bias, if you want. Uh, it's interesting also because it's a simple enough model which can be uh, adapted to or used in many cases where the number of data is not too large. And, and deep networks would actually not work because they, they are it would be very difficult to avoid overfitting. OK, so uh, I would like to discuss this model now and say a few things about the phase diagram of this model. And also, I, I will finish with some uh, recent work we have done on, on trying to see how to make the representation that this model are, are building uh, interpretable and what it means in terms of, of cost. What is the cost of being more interpretable? OK, so, um, so what is the interpretation of a machine? So how it works? So we can, OK, so what we will do is that we will look at two different stages. So imagine, actually, I have already presented on my visible layer some configuration of the data. And then I'm asking what is going on on one hidden unit. So you have many hidden units here. But I will focus on one of them only. And I can do that because condition to the visible configuration x, then the probability distribution of the uh, hidden units are just uh, factorized, right? They are independent. So I don't care about the other one. Let, let me focus on one of them. And the probability of h mu uh, condition to x, this is simply proportional to exponential minus u mu of h mu plus h mu times um, the sum of the i, w mu i, x i, right? Which I will call u mu. To keep the same notation as previously with the phi of u, right? OK, so now, um, so let me drop the index mu because I'm looking at only one of them. So I will just forget it uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, line. So this is a distribution over h. So let's look at the value of h, which has maximum probability. What is the most likely of h if I condition to x? So the most likely h 
is the one which maximizes the, the exponent here. And it will be the solution of minus u prime of h star plus u equal to 0. I'm assuming that everything is, can be differentiated. There is no problem, and so on. OK, so for instance, in the case where u of h, so in the quadratic case, which is the one I introduced before, uh, u of h was, if you remember, h squared over 2. Maybe there is a proportionality coefficient. doesn't matter very much. u prime is simply h. So that means if I plot the most likely value as a function of u, I get a very simple plot, which is just a, a, a linear curl. OK, sorry. Now I need a better uh, yellow things. Yes, this one is better. I get a yellow relation, right? That's correspond to the quadratic case. So this tells you, this you can say, OK, if I condition to x, u is going to be the input to the hidden unit. And you ask what is going to be the most likely value of the hidden unit. It's given by h star. And you see that the transfer function, which tells you what is the most likely value as a function of the input, is just um, the identity here. It's just a, a linear function. right? But that was for this particular choice of a potential. And I can choose many other potentials. So for instance, one transfer function, which is very popular in neural networks, is uh, rectified linear units. right? So you could say, OK, I don't want this. But I would like something which is 0 up to some threshold theta, and then which grows linearly. Rectify linear units with some threshold here. OK, so what is the interest of having a rectified linear units? It means, OK, so for instance, if I look at the linear case, my input here was u is simply the dot product between the weight vector and x. But I could consider that if the dot product is actually too small, too close to 0, it does not correspond to any signal in the data. It does not any measure any similarity between the weights and x, but it's just noise, right? And I don't care. I don't want to transmit this noise to the latent factor, OK, to the latent variable. So I would just kill everything which is small and close to 0. You can also say that h could be interpreted as the degree of presence of the degree of similarity between the weight vector and x. And then this degree of similarity shouldn't be a negative number. So in that case, you kill all the negative value of u, right? But you can imagine other transfer function. But the ReLU co correspond to that. And you will see it's very important for applications. OK, so then you can ask, what is the potential for ReLU? Then the potential for ReLU is actually something that I, I just wrote here. And you can check this is true. u of h, <coughs> you choose in this way. The potential should be plus infinity for negative h, right? so that you want to uh, avoid going to negative h. And then it starts with a finite slope theta here. And then you know it grows as h squared. So it's h squared plus. Uh, h theta. And that corresponds to the uh, rectified linear units. So you see this, this uh, way of thinking about potential is very flexible, because then you can encode any kind of transfer function you would like. I mean, a, a large variety of transfer function you, you would be interested in. <coughs> OK, so the meaning of this is condition to x, this h's here will extract some measure of the similarity between the attached weight vectors and, and x, right? Which is, uh, which is simple. So if you do that, then you can, so we, we looked at what was going on this way. Now, now you can say what is going on the other way. Suppose now I have a H configuration, and we'd like to see what is the con conditional distribution on the visible layer. OK, so now I have all my h mu variables or units, which are fixed. 
And then I'm considering among all the visible units, only one of them. And again, I can do that here because I don't have any um, interaction within the visible uh, layer. So they are all independent condition to H. And you can ask what is the probability of Xi condition to H. And is, this is obviously given by exponential minus the potential acting on Xi plus uh, Xi sum over mu W mu I um, H mu. So that, you see, plays the same role as the input. The, we had an input to the uh, hidden units. Now we have an input to the visible units, and that I will call u tilde of i. The tilde means to the visible one, right? I'm not sure it's a nice notation, but OK. It makes a distinction with the u mu. So this is the input from latent variables or latent units to uh, visible unit i. OK, so in the case where the potential v of x is simply a quadratic function, then it means that this, this distribution will have a simple Gaussian shape, and it will be centered in u tilde of i. But in more generally, if you have more complicated potential, it can be anything, right? OK, so as I said, this operation here is meant to x. So what, what you do this operation, you condition to x, then the values you will get on this uh, hidden layer is a set of I mean, it's, it's a set of measurements of the similarity between the attached weight vectors and x. So it, it will extract some features, right, from x. It will tell you what is the degree of presence of each w mu in, in x. So essentially, it builds a representation. So this hidden layer is the representation layer. So what is the interest of doing the other operation? So here, if you have a representation and you condition to it and you ask what kind of x you will generate, you see it's very useful to do generation. Conditional to representation. So if you ask, OK, I would like some data which are, have a little bit of w1, a little bit of w2, a lot of w3, and so on. Then by putting these numbers here, then you can generate data which should actually have the kind of features that you ask for, right? Of course, this is supposing that the Ws are not random, but they were learned from the data. Otherwise, it would be just meaningless. But we will do that later on. OK. So um, and also, this, this uh, dual procedure is actually an algorithm for sampling. You can start from any x here, uh, sample the h's, which is easy to do because they are just all independent, condition to x. Once you have the edge, you can sample the axis, which again is easy to do, and then you can iterate that. The fact that it's easy doesn't mean the algorithm is efficient. I'm not saying it's actually mixing well and reaches equilibrium. It, does, it is not more efficient than standard Monte Carlo on, on the Ising model, for instance. And I will come back to that later on. But, actually it's, but at least it's easy to do on a computer. OK, so how do we learn uh, RBM from data? And I just want to show you some examples. Uh, so the algorithm to learn is, so there are several algorithms, but just to give the principle of the algorithm. That can be done just by maximum likelihood, at least in principle. Eventually, we, I mean, we can also add some, uh, uh, some prior over the uh, parameters. So it could be a maximum uh, a posteriori estimation of the parameters. So suppose you have now some, some data set. So you have a vector x1, x2, up to xd. These are your data. And then you, so, so what you would like to do is actually to maximize. You want to maximize over all your parameters. Um, the uh, log, let's say the sum over the data points, of the log probability of your data points, which depends on all parameters. Okay, so just to be a little bit more precise about this, so how what is this uh, log like this uh, likelihood here? So the probability of x can be seen uh, formally as an integration over h 
over the latent factor of P of XH. So this is given by this. Okay. Divided by the normalization, which is exactly the same thing as the, so maybe I should put XD here so for data points. So the X's here are frozen to the value of the data. And then here at the denominator, of course, I should integrate over all X's here, exponential of the same thing, with um, X instead of XD, right? For the normalization. Is it okay for the notation? So this is just a marginal over X. And we would like, what we'd like to do is to maximize the parameters. So where are the parameters? You have very important parameters in the weights here. So these are the parameters. You have also parameters defining the family of potential you are interested in. So for instance, if you want to do rectified linear units, uh, your potential, as I, if you remember, they are infinite here. And then they grow uh, quadratically. So you have maybe A over 2H squared plus theta H. And that should be found for any mu. So you will have twice m, I mean, let's say two m parameters here that you would like to find. And you may have also parameters here on your variables, um, which define the potentials also, right? So for instance, if you have uh, a so quadratic potential, it could be the variance on the mean of this, uh, of this uh, um, single uh, visible unit uh, potential. OK? So. What does that mean in practice? So how do we maximize this? So the idea is that, well, you can write, this is done by, by uh, gradient ascent. So you can write down the uh, gradient of this, um, of this log likelihood. So LL is going to be the log likelihood of the data. And if you compute the gradient, for, for instance, with respect to the W mu i, so I don't do the, the full calculation, but it's actually pretty easy to see. You, you see it immediately. So you take the log of this, so you have the log of the, of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. So now do the uh, derivative with respect to W mu i. And what you see is an x i h mu, which is going in front of the exponential, right? And when you take the derivative of a log of something, then you will have a normalization, which is exactly this numerator, which becomes the denominator of the first term. Is it OK? So you see what is going to happen is that you will have a x i d h mu, so maybe I should write it here. So there is several averages here. h mu defined for this particu particular data point. So here I have an average, which is the average on the conditional RBM with the con con conditional RBM. So when you fix xd on the visible layer, then the hidden unit mu will have some average value if you do the average here. And then that should be here average over the, the data. So over the d's. So that corresponds to the derivative of a log of a numerator. And then you have minus the derivative of a log of a denominator. And you get exactly the same kind of, of uh, uh, correlation function, except that now there are no data anymore. So you get, actually, the xi h mu from the full RBM model. So if you sample your RBM, then you'll have some um, configuration on the visible layer and some configuration on the hidden layer, and they will have some correlation function, xih mu. Is it okay? Yes? And you see, uh, so when, when you do gradient ascent, then these two moments, the moment that, of, of the, that you can compute from the data and the moments that you can compute from the model, they should match. So the fact that the gradient is equal to zero is called a moment matching condition, which is well known in Boltzmann machines. So one important point I would like to mention, if, if you start from W equal to 0, then of course it's a solution of the gradient equal to 0. Okay? Because then the correlation disappears, and you get 0 minus 0, and so it's a fixed point. right? But it's an unstable fixed point. In fact, if you want to, to do the um, calculation a little bit further, um, I leave this as an exercise. You can expand this to second order in W, compute the derivative, and you, you get exactly the dynamics here. So in first, to first order, so it gets, if you do expansion in W, 
you get zero to the first order. I mean, there is no term when W goes to zero. And then what you get is something like that. I just give the result, gamma ij w mu j minus w uh, mu i, where this is equal to the Pearson correlation of the data. So the Pearson correlation is simply the correlation where uh, the variables have been centered and the variance are set to one. Okay. And you see what is going on. So at initial time, you start from W very small, very close to zero, so that this expansion is correct. What is going to happen is that you get um, the gradient equal to this. So if you imagine this is DWI mu, DW mu I over time, right? If you do just gradient descent, then you will have an exponential growth along the direction of a top eigenvector of the correlation matrix. So what is going to happen at, at small time is just the network is going to extract PCA, the top component. And here you see absolutely no interaction between the different hidden units. So, so initially, all the, the weight vectors will look the same, right, to first order in W. So they all extract um, the, um, the, the top components. So of course, that, that is meaningless, and that's not a very nice way to, to do, right? So if you want to capture the interaction between the hidden units, you need to go to uh, the next order, the quadratic term, and you will see some kind of what people in neuroscience would call lateral inhibition between the different hidden units, which prevent all these units from capturing the same statistical information from the data, which would be very useless, right? So in practice, what you see, and I, I'm just uh, explaining this quickly, but there, are, there is a review. You can have, there is a review uh, by uh, Dessel and collaborators, which is quite recent, where all these things are explained. I think it's 2018 or 19, I don't remember. Uh, okay, so what you see if you go to, so, okay, so to, you get first gamma ij, But then you will see interaction between W mu i and W mu j, W mu i. And then you see also interaction between the different components. So W mu i and W mu j. So typically, what the, the kind of interaction you can see, for instance, uh, for some data, are terms of this order. I just want to mention that. So I think it's interesting. OK, so you see an, a term which is unstable here, which leads to very uh, fast growth of a component. OK, so that means you start initially from your, your typical, uh, your top components of, a, of the correlation matrix, so it's going to grow. But then you see here, uh, the, the growth here, if you go to uh, nonlinear terms, is going to be very fast. So you would say that it would grow every, everywhere. But he, in fact, here you have a global inhibition, which try actually to uh, push down everybody. So what is going to happen is a kind of winner take all uh, competition between all the different uh, weights attached to the same hidden units, when depending on the initial condition and also the, the different kind of pattern of correlation statistic in your data, some weights here are going to grow fast and they will inhibit the other one. So this is really the basic mechanism to build a receptive field, a patch detector, something which is local uh, in the data. So the hidden unit will be concentrated around some, some limited portion of your data, thanks to this kind of mechanism. Is it okay? Yes? Okay, so I, I'm, ju I'm just going fast here, but you can have more information about that in this, uh, in this paper. Okay, so I would like to show you uh, some examples of that and, and one question we were interested in. So maybe, uh, yes, if you can, thank you. Yeah. And I will just show you a, a very basic example on MNIST to see what actually the machine is learning.
Thank you. Okay, so we just uh, look at what is going on on MNIST, and there have been a lot of papers doing that. I mean, with RBMs, a lot of papers, let's say several papers. And I just want to show you the kind of result you get. So you can learn this. So I'm showing you a um, result with an RBM here. Okay, so here is an RBM. So with 400 hidden units, so m equal to 400. And of course, n is 28 by 28, so it's a bit less than 800, right? And they are all rectified linear units um, in the hidden layer. And you see here, after learning, so I, I'm not showing anything about the learning here. You just see the, tra you just see the sampling phase. You see 10 uh, Mark uh, Markov chains here, 10 Monte, Ma uh, Monte Carlo Markov chains, uh, which are independent from each other. They just start from uh, initial random condition. So let me try to stop it and show at the beginning what are the initial conditions. OK, just some kind of uh, white and black pixel here. And then you see very quickly they converge and they go to, I would like to call nice digits or nice looking digits, right? They are not all perfect, but they seem uh, pretty nice. And that you get you know, with this uh, very uh, simple RBM, right? So on the right side, you see another RBM, which was trained exactly in the same condition, except that now the transfer function is linear. So th that means the, the potential is not this uh, you know, hard wall and then linear quadratic, but only a parabolic potential, right? So you see that the quality seems to be uh, much worse. And I would like to understand, so one thing we would like to understand is why it's actually worse with quadratic potential than with the ReLU. So I already said a few things about that, so it's not so surprising, but I'll come to that. And more interestingly, actually, uh, one thing which is interesting is to look at the kind of representation which are built by the machine. And I want to show you some results which were obtained from this paper. Where people, they, okay, so here it's a different kind of RBM. It's not a rectified linear unit, so it's not li a quadratic one, it's just binary hidden units. So the H mu's are plus or minus ones, which is another kind of potential which is confining the H mu's, right? And what you see here are the weights which are long on the same data set when the number of hidden units is m equal to 16 or m equal to 100. So how do you understand that? So each square here corresponds to the receptive field, so the set of weights seen by one hidden unit, which looks at the MNIST grid here. So there are 28 by 28 weights, which are represented here in, in, in a, um, a gray, black and white color, uh, code. So that means that black means very positive, white means very negative, or the opposite, I don't remember, and gray means close to zero. Okay? And what you see that is for m equal to 16, you kind of guess some kind of strange digits, but they are close to digits, right? While for m equal to 100, you have a completely different way of coding or uh, representing the data with local patches here, right? Which have nothing to do with this kind of representation. So of course, the quality is not the same in terms of quality of the data which are produced. But I think what is interesting here is why do we get this kind of different representation? Uh, is there a qualitative difference between the two? And why do they emerge, right? And how this depends on the hyperparameters in particular, the number of hidden units, but also the kind of potentials that shape the activity of these hidden units. OK? So that's the question I, I, I'm going to discuss now. OK, so can we understand these different regimes uh, from the, um, using some kind of uh, simple statistical mechanics uh, argument? So to do that, I would like first to do a reminder on the, on the Hopfield model, which is an old model uh, from 40 years ago. So does everybody know about the Hopfield model here? Is there anybody who doesn't know about it? Yes, OK. So I just want to uh, briefly uh, um, explain what it is. Uh, so it's going to be fast, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer additional questions if you have on the model later on. Right? OK, so um, in the Hopfield model, the, uh, you have probability over a set of variables, x1, xn, which is given by um, the exponential of some uh, form here. I mean, you have a quadratic form over um, the xi and xj, over the x's, given by this expression. So this is proportional. Of course, there is a normalization constant. And t here is the temperature, which is a real number, positive. And the gij are given by this expression here. 
So it's a sum of the M patterns, and they are very similar to the patterns of activity I told you about uh, before in, in neural networks. And in fact, so, it, this model, so there are plus or minus ones here in the standard model, and the x's also are plus or minus ones. They can be also 0 or 1, doesn't change much. And the idea is that this model is actually, uh, it was invented or introduced as an auto-associative memory model, which means that it builds a, a recurrent network. Um, you can have a, a dynamics of uh, the neurons, which is exactly the one I wrote before in the first part of the lecture. And um, this model actually defines uh, when, when the dynamic is run, the uh, argument of the exponential here is increasing over time. So it will converge towards local maxima here. And this local maxima are engineered in order to be similar to this pattern, which are desired fixed point of the activity. So it's very brief, but essentially, this is the idea of your field model, right? So the phase diagram was uh, um, studied by uh, Amit Gufon Sampolinsky in the 80s. in 84, 85. Um, and what they found is that in the plane of the temperature on the y-axis and the ratio of the number of patterns on the uh, x-axis, then you have different regimes. And essentially, this, there is a regime where, at high temperature, the average value of the um, activity of a neuron is 0. And this is true if you average over, this, over the patterns, but also if you average the the variance here, so they are essentially in the they are not magnetized along anything. So it's a, a, a very high temperature regime. You have a regime where actually the temperature is high, but the activity of the neurons here uh, is going to be equal to zero when average of the patterns. But you have a non-zero activity if you look at a, a given sample. So depending on the initial condition, the network will get trapped in a configuration which has nothing to do with the patterns you would like to memorize. And there is a regime where actually this network works as a memory here. And what you will get is that you can characterize the similarity between the activity of, an, uh, of, uh, of a network and the patterns here by looking at these other parameters. Uh, and you will find, for instance, that one of them, let's say for mu equal one, you will have m, uh, this m here, which is going to be larger than zero, and for all the other mu's, it's going to be uh, to go to zero in the large n limit. And the, the choice of mu depends on your initial condition. Of course, you have created different basin of attraction, and your initial condition will bring you to one of these memories. So is it a, it's, it's a very fast presentation, but essentially this is the, the, the idea of the, of the model. So it's interesting to think about this model in RBM terms, right? Because actually, if you think about it, when you choose u of h equal to h squared over 2, then the RBM is exactly identical to this model, where the weights are equal to the patterns, right? And the number of hidden units is the number of patterns. So that's something we saw before, right? So, so you can think about the RBM as a whole field model. In this case, or let's say you can think about the Hopkins model as an RBM, more exact to this, put it this way. So you have n visible units here. You have n equal to alpha n hidden units, which are all subject to a quadratic potential. And each uh, hidden unit is connected to the visible unit with the weights equal to xi i mu. And if you do the integration over the HEs with the quadratic potential, then you get exactly this effective measure on the visible units. Is it clear? OK, so how do we understand the different phases of the Hoffman model in this RBM language? That's an interesting question, right? So you see, let me, let me go uh, to low temperature, because this regime of x is equal to 0 on average is not very interesting, right? So if I am at low temperature, then this phase here, which corresponds to the uh, phase, the retrieval phase here, corresponds to a case where the activity here on the visible uh, layer will be similar to one of the pattern, let's say mu equal one. So what is going to happen is that I have x is xi, which is similar to xi i mu, mu equal one, 
So that means when I do the dot product with the weight vectors, which is psi mu, then the input, which is going to be here, is going to be very strong. So this hidden unit mu equal one will be very strongly activated. While the other ones, since the patterns are statistically orthogonal, they will be much weaker in terms of activation. So if we want to be more quantitative here, I, I should put weights which are psi over square root of n in order to correspond to these weights here, which are normalized by one, by one over n. So we can compute the activity here. So if I do the dot product between the x's and h's here, then you see that u1, which was the input I, I defined before, that is going to be psi dot psi, if I put exactly psi on the visible layer here, over square root of n, so it's going to be of the order of square root of n. While if I compute the overlap between any other psi and psi 1, which is this visible configuration here, it will be here, for instance, u, u, any other mu larger than 1, of the order of 1, plus or minus 1, random. So by presenting this pattern here, I get a very strongly activated hidden unit, and all the other ones, they are just mildly and randomly activated. Since the linear, uh, for the quadratic potential, the transfer function is linear. Is it okay? So now what is going back if from this configuration, I try to sample here. What is the um, input on my uh, visible unit number i, which I call u tilde of i before? So it will be the sum, it will be the dot product between the weights and the h's here. So from this hidden unit, which is very strong, I get square root of n times psi i mu equal one over square root of n, okay? And so they cancel here, so I get a component of the order of one. Plus the other one, so the other one I have, how many of them I have? m minus one, m is large, so let's say m, square root of m times the component, which is of the order uh, one over square root of n. So you see here you get something which is noisy, Gaussian, of the order of square root of alpha. And that's the problem, because if alpha is too large, then that will kill the signal. And then this is how you move from this phase to that one. OK? So you can see here you, you enter this phase by due to the fact that all these hidden units, which do not represent anything, are just interfering with the signal here incoming onto the visible unit. So that suggests immediately a way to improve about, uh, of your field model. And that explains also what we saw here, right? When, when we did uh, so the simulation here, this is just due to the noise created by all the other hidden units, which are just meaningless. But they are there, and they mess up everything on the visible layer. OK, but now, if you have rectified linear units, it's going to be much better, right? Because what you can do is to kill all this noise. So again, with the linear transfer function, you have one. So one, hidden, so one input here, u, which is of the order square root of n, and the corresponding h is order square root of n. And you have a lot of things here, which are of the order one, negative or positive, which are very noisy, m on minus one of them. So what you can do is have a threshold theta here, which is of the order of one, large but small compared to square root of n. And then if you use a rectified linear unit, uh, I mean, a transfer function, that will kill everything and all these h's here will be set to zero. So that means they will not send any interference, any noise onto the visible layer. And it will work much better, okay? Is it clear for the mechanism? So that means that by pushing theta to high values here, but small compared to square root of n, you can virtually make your uh, hidden layer here as large as you want. So that's an advantage. Since you, you can make it as large as you want, that means that you can represent many features in the input data, so you will have a richer dictionary to express your data. Okay? And you can kill the noise by this mechanism. Does this give a capacity boost? So, um, how do you define the capacity? Like the alpha C for the quadratic potential. 
Yeah, I mean, the capacity is defined as the number of parameters here of, of, uh, of patterns over the num that you can store over the number of coefficients. And that, does, that is not boosted, right? Uh, since you, if you increase this thing here, you, you are also increasing the number of synaptic coefficients, right? It's not like embedding more psi mu in the single jij. Here you have more, if you increase the number of units, you have also an, an increased number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so, um, so, okay. So, the other things which is not nice with the Hoffman model, so we just, we just say how uh, having a threshold is going to help and kill a lot of the noise. The other thing which is not nice is this single pattern, which is uh, this single hidden unit, which is very strongly activated here. That means that in terms of expressivity, this model is very poor. You know, and that corresponds very much to the kind of prototype uh, representation I was mentioning here. Uh, so this is called also grandmother representation. You see, you present some data and they will, be, they will match one particular weight vectors and they will be orthogonal to the other one. And then what you have on your, on your configuration here is just one weight. So you can choose which one is activated and that's it. That's the number of data points that you can generate, maybe with a little bit of noise, but it's very poor. A much better representation uh, would be obtained by, for instance, choosing to activate a certain number of hidden units among all the possible ones. Suppose you activate L among M, then you would have a combinatorial way of choosing the L among the M's, and you would have much more diversity on the visible layer. That would be much more powerful. And that looks like much more what you see here, right? When you have a lot of small patches, in order to build one nice looking digit, you have to activate many small patches, but then you can combine them in many different ways and have a large diversity of digits, right? But here you are stuck to these prototypes. Okay, so, um, so do we see these other uh, representation regimes uh, in simple model of statistical physics? Yes, we do. And I want to mention what we uh, did briefly, which is actually, it's a, it's a caricature uh, of model in the sense that we don't do learning, we just do, um, it's a null model where we don't try to fit some data, but we just choose randomly the weights and then look at what is going on uh, on the visible layer and on the hidden layer. So I just want to mention that and then uh, show you that. Okay, so now maybe I should show you. No, before I do that, I should show you what we see in the data. Okay, so if you look at the machine which works, so this one, then you can have a look at how it represents the data, right? So the representation here, I mean, these are the weights that are similar to what you see, I mean, some kind of small patches. And now you can look at the histograms of the activation of a, of a hidden unit. And you see that most hidden units, the large majority of them, over 400, they're actually silent. They're just shut down, okay? So at any time, if you look at a visible configuration, at least half of the hidden units are shut down. But they're not always the same. So that's why you have a lot of diversity. And then you have a lot also uh, a few tens, which is, you know, maybe 5% uh, of uh, all total uh, hidden units, which are very strongly activated. And this one are going to tell you how many small patches you combine in order to build a digit. And now you can look also at the weights, and I, I, I'm just showing you very briefly the phenomenology here. So these weights that you find at the end of a training, so on s uh, different uh, visible un uh, hidden units, six of them here. So you see, this is the intensity of the weights. So remember, there are 800, uh, close to 800 um, uh, I components here. You see uh, patches here of very strong negative weights, very strong positive weights, and they essentially measure some kind of local contrast in some portion of, of, the, uh, of the image, as you would expect from local features uh, detector, right? Local contrast detectors. And the fact that the weights are actually very strong, that means that the model is actually working at very low temperature, effectively, after the learning. I mean, if you look at a digit, so this is just one representative uh, picture of the visible uh, layer here, configuration, you see very few white dots outside the digit, right? So the model is very, strong, is very strongly at, at very low temperature. The weights are very strong, and they impose a black pixel or white pixel. You cannot do something in between, except on the boundaries here, well, you, do the, you can see the conditional averages, they are a little bit gray because it's just a boundary, it can move a little bit. Okay, so that uh, suggests to look at a model 
where um, we have a, a lot of, sp of sparse weights and strong weights. Here. So I will consider a model where I have n visible units, m hidden units, and I will just connect them here through some weights, and we, I will choose w mu i to be equal to zero uh, with some priority one minus p. So p is a number between zero and one. It will be to Plus, equal to plus w over square root of n with priority p over 2, and minus w over n, square root of n, sorry, with priority p over 2. So p is the number that you can tune as you want. So we will be interested in the regime where p is going to be small, but of the order 1. So this is inspired from these empirical findings, where you see that it seems a finite fraction, large fraction of the weights are actually very close to 0. They are small. OK. Then um, my uh, visible units here will be 0 ones. Let's say black and white pixel, pixels. The h mu here, they will be uh, fixed by rectified linear units with some threshold theta, which is a parameter of the model. And then I will have also local potential acting on these visible units. And since they are 0 ones, the only thing you can do is, is the field which is going to bias these units. So we'll have a field. G i, which are supposed to be uniform equal to G. So it creates a potential V of x i, which is minus G x i. So if G is negative, it, it favors 0. If G is positive, it favors 1 compared to the other value. OK, so this is the model. And m here is equal to alpha n. Now, I'm asking in the limit when n goes to infinity at fixed ratio alpha and m also, and then the ratio is fixed, p is fixed, theta is fixed, g is fixed, what are the phases of this model? So you see, it's a model where we don't do any learning, right? So the interesting thing about learning some kind of data here does not exist. But you could say, OK, the learning of the data tells me that there are some interesting statistical features about the weights. I see that many of them are equal to 0. They have also a strong, the ones which are not equal to 0 are strong, so I would expect W to be strong here, right? P is going to be, I don't know, maybe uh, 90%. And alpha is whatever it is, 400 over 800 here. And G, I can also measure by looking at the local biases here. And G should be fixed in order to have the average activity, uh, the average number of, of uh, active pixels in an MNIST digit, for instance. And now, so you do that, and then you ask what is going to happen. OK, so I won't do the calculation because it, it would be long, but it's very similar to the uh, Amit Gufon Sompolinsky calculation for the Hoffi model with, the, with a few important differences. So the differences are first the presence of a threshold. If you, if you prefer the presence of a non-quadratic potential over the h, and that makes a big difference because that kills a lot of the noise. And this is why you can go to very large value of alpha even above this 0.14 capacity of the whole field model without entering the spin glass phase. So you can send alpha to very large values, 0.5 here. Um, the other difference is that you get a lot of sparsity in the weight. In fact, we are interested in the limit where p is going to be very small. We send p to 0 after having sent n to infinity. And we also, uh, so these are the two uh, major differences. The capacity increases because of the threshold? Yes. You can make alpha as arbitrarily large because you put a threshold theta. You have to scale theta in a correct way. OK, so um, since I have limited time, I just want to say, um, to find the, the regime which is interesting. Is it okay for the model? Can I erase that? Yes.
Okay, so, so on top of the phases which I already told you about, which are this grandmother phase where only one hidden unit is very strongly activated, and the phase where you know, get these this glassy things where the configuration here do not look like anything similar to the patterns, then you see a new phase here where a substantial number of the hidden units is, uh, are activated. So by substantial, I should be very careful here. It's very small compared to M. So remember, we have M hidden units. So M is alpha and goes to infinity. So here, the number of activated, strongly activated hidden units is finite of the order of one. But it scales as L over P, where L is of the order of one and P goes to zero. So first, you send N to infinity. So the machine is extremely large. And then you look at what is left. And so the fraction of the very uh, strongly activated is nothing, is zero compared to that. But the number is much larger than one when P is, is small. OK? So L is a number that has to be optimized over. So it's, let's say cons it's something which has to be found. Or the one, I will explain you just in, in a second how to find it, right? And this is in the, in the regime where P goes to 0 after sending n to infinity, OK? So now what you do is that you present here. So and they are all strongly activated. So actually, what happens is that um, if you look at the um, one of these hidden uh, units here, so let me call this unit S as strong and this one as weak. Because they have actually weak activation. So what means, that means that actually my digit here, my configuration here, is, can be seen as some kind of combination of the weight vectors of the features attached to these strongly activated hi hidden units, right? While the other ones, they are essentially orthogonal. They don't do anything. OK. so. What is u for a strong hidden unit? Well, it's going to be proportional to the weight here, w, that's the intensity of the weight, w over square root of n, times um, the fraction of the weights which are actually not equal to 0, p, times the fraction uh, of, times the total number of, hidden, of visible units which project onto this unit, which is this. So it's going to be of the order of w, p, square root of n. So it's large of the order of square root of n. If I look at a weak one, then the dot product is going to be essentially to equal to 0. They are not magnetized, but I mean, you get just uh, I mean, random noise. So it's going to be w of the square root of, uh, of n, the same intensity of the weights. But now you get the square root of this with a plus or minus, essentially. So it's going to be plus or minus w uh, square root of p. OK, so how do you want to choose your, your, your threshold theta of the ReLU? Again, so we'll have the big ones here, which will be of the order square root of n here, times p. And the small ones, they are all over the place here, order square root of p. So you want to choose your threshold here, theta, which is going to be uh, of the order square root of p times some constant c here, which is large compared to 1. So if you do that, we silence most of these guys, right? It, it should be at least of the order of magnitude, right? But do you want to put it too large, otherwise you would kill the important guys. So now that was this way. Now you can see what happens when you go this way. Suppose you have a configuration here, and you ask what is going to happen. So we do it uh, fast. So you can ask, OK, so this is my visible unit i here. And you ask, what is the input received by i? And here, we can forget about the weakly activated hidden units because they are all killed by the threshold. So we get only the strong one. And the strong one will be uh, actually injecting some input. So u tilde of i will be of the order uh, of. So how many um, hidden units are strongly activated? This is L over p. What are the level of activation? Well, wp square root of n. And then the project with the weights here, which is w over square root of n. And you have a priority p that is not equal to 0. 
right? So if you do that, you see that it's going, so the P cancel with this one, square root of n, you get something which is W squared LP. So this is finite, right? But this is small because P, I suppose P to be small, maybe 10%, even less than that. Okay, so now you can have a, a local field active here. If it should be of the order of P to be comparable to that. Okay, and now you ask what should be the effective temperature, the inverse temperature. This is the inverse temperature in order for this to, 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 be, to be okay. Then the input should be of the order one. That means that the inverse temperature, beta, or if you prefer W squared, should be of the order one over P in order to compensate that one. So in this regime, you see that the weight should be large. So you compensate the sparsity of the weight by the strong intensity. You have few strong weights. And this is exactly what we see in the training. And that, that makes the model not too much noisy, right? So how is determined this small L? Well, I get you in, in the model, you get some kind of free energy here. And, and L is the one which is minimizing this free energy, right? And depending on the value of parameters, you find this is L equal to zero. In that case, you are back to the grandmother representation, the standard of field case. Or you get a non-zero L, and that's this, the onset of a phase transition to this regime. OK, so I just want to show you that. Uh, so when you do the training, of course, you choose uh, the, uh, some regularization. So you can push the regularization to favor more sparse weights. Right, and so the kind of regularization you can do is something like that, like L2 or L1 squared. You can do different things, and you can see what is going to be the number of strongly activated units as you push sparser weight. Right, and the prediction is that it should scale as one over p, and this is exactly what you see, for instance, in NIST, as you uh, decrease p here by pushing for more regularization by increasing the penalty here in front of that. When you do the learning, you see that L is increasing. And you see that the small patches, which are detected in the visible layer by the hidden units, getting, are getting smaller and smaller. Right? So of course, we don't have many decades. We have only one decade. But that's something that you, you see. So it seems to be OK with, uh, with the, uh, the real data. OK, so I, I think I have still five minutes. So I would like to say just one more thing about the uh, um, interpretability. Um, OK, so. So the interest of being in this regime is that, uh, compared to a regime when you, you have non-sparse weights, is that, OK, we have more active uh, hidden units. And the, each active hidden unit is looking at a very small patch on the visible configuration. So whether it's active or not, you understand what it does, right? So it's easier to interpret uh, this kind of regime than a regime where all the weights are different from zero and you don't know what is responsible for what, right? But of course, you see that. Actually, when we penalize non-sparse weights, we introduce this regularization. And that has a cost in terms of log likelihood. So in fact, and this, these are the standard curves that you have already seen. If I call gamma the intensity of a regularization, and you plot the log likelihood, for the training set, you will get something which decreases like that as a function of gamma. And for the test set, you get something which does something like that. OK? So in principle, you should choose. So this is test, and this is train. So in principle, you should choose the one which maximizes the test set uh, look like you, right? But what we see in many, many examples, so in MNIS, but the uh, kind of application we have done on, on biological data sets, is that this part of the curve is actually extremely flat. It goes down, but it's, it goes down very slowly. So that means that if you want more sparse weights, you can go to very large value of gamma. Of course, you pay something. There is a decrease in terms of a likelihood. But what you gain is that it's much easier to understand what these weights are doing. So the issue of, I mean, the trade-off between the sparsity, which helps you to interpret, and the log likelihood is an interesting one. And um, we have been trying to do more on this. So I got five minutes. So I just want to say uh, one thing we have been trying to do recently. And then I will stop. OK. 
Okay, so um, so what I, I just want to, to to briefly sketch is something about the disentanglement of representation, which is an issue which is important in unsupervised learning, and that. Uh, Different people have been working on, and that's uh, something we have done very recently with Jorge Cosio and Simona at ENS. So uh, the disentanglement of representation, uh, have you already heard about this problem? No, you have never heard about that? OK, I'm a little bit surprised, but OK. <laughs> Maybe it's not important at all, after all. <laughs> OK, I thought it was important. OK, so let me tell you anyway about this problem. So the question is the following. Uh, suppose you have data xd, and you have also some labels attached to your data, sigma d. I will assume that there, it's a binary label, but it could be more than binary, right? So for instance, I'm assuming there is a single one, but it could be more than one. So one example I will mention very briefly is the example, your data has just images, of, I mean, of faces, and the label could be uh, male, female, young, old, whatever that means. Uh, you know, um, eyeglasses, no eyeglasses, whatever you can think of, right? Um, blonde, dark hair, and so on. So you take one label like that. So now if you learn your representation with a machine, so you can do autoencoders, you can do uh, the RBM or even a deeper network. So you will have essentially here your axes. Here you will have your age representation. So you learn in an unsupervised, unsupervised way from that. And then you ask, can I predict the sigmas from the h's? What you see is generally the information about the sigmas is really mixed up here in the h's. That's a general case, right? So this is the entanglement problem. So if you prefer, suppose I look at h1, one direction, and h2, and, but there are many directions. OK, it's just a two-dimensional projection. Um, so you, you can have the zeros data, which are the red one, and you can have the yellow data, which are the uh, plus ones. I've lost my yellow. Now it's here. So essentially, when you look at all your data points, you will have data points all over the place. This is typically what you get. Not always the case, but in many situations, right? Well, what you would like to have, ideally, is something which is disentangled, so maybe clustered, if you prefer, where you have the, a nice bunch of data here, a nice bunch here. So along the H2 direction, everything is mixed up, but along the H1, it's really well separate. So that means the information about the label you could get by looking only at H1, for instance. That would give you the value of a label, for instance, the sign of H. Or let's say whether it's larger than something, it would give you 0, 1. So there have been a lot of works on this issue, and I just want to mention one very briefly. So have you heard about the FEDER network? By the people who was some, no, never heard about that. So OK, it's a nice way to try to, to obtain disentangled representation with autoencoders. So let me just briefly mention how that works. OK, so I can erase that. So the idea is the following. You do the training with an autoencoder, right? So here's the, your autoencoder. So you have your axis here. You have the output layer, which is of the same size, obviously. And you would like uh, the output to be equal to x, or at least as close as possible. And usually, you have your representation h here, and you get some weights. And then you project back, right? And this is the usual standard thing for the autoencoder with only one hidden layer. So here, imagine your data. They have also, you know, so the binary labels for at least a portion of your data, which is sufficient to do some training. So now you add here, so the decoder has access to the label and to the representation. It's a 2017 paper, Lampel et al. Okay, so. You have a representation, you, you take your data, you build a representation, you add the label, and then you build the, the, the thing here. So it seems quite redundant. But on top of that, you will add some constraint that the HE should not be able to predict the value of sigma. So what you do is that you would like to predict sigma from H, and you want this to be, you, you look at the best, so you have some network here, 
which is trying to output sigma from H only. And you want the best discriminator when you optimize over D of this thing here, essentially it will do one half. Sorry for the uh, kind of uh, hand waving notation, but I think you understand what I mean. That means that you should essentially try to do the training in such a way that the decoder is able to reconstruct everything, but the encoder is such that H does not contain the information about the label anymore. So it should try to remove everything about the label, but keep what is necessary in order to be able to reconstruct X once you add the label. Is it clear? That's a sigma here. So, it's a, so your data has vector x, the image, plus uh, one bit. So you see, you, you want to build a representation where the label cannot be predicted from, cannot be predicted from that. But if you give back the label on top of it, then you are able to reconstruct the image. Right? So the interest of that is very obvious, because if you're able to do that, then you take your image, you have this. Then you can change the label, then you should be able to change, for instance, the same guy without, uh, with high glasses, for instance. Okay, this kind of thing, so going from male to female, or whatever you can think of. It okay? How does this create disen disentanglement, or is it not? Sorry? How does this help with disentanglement? Yeah, because you see that all the direction here in H's, they are just label free, right? So that means that you, you have built a representation where actually, um, there is no information about sigma, and you, you just put it back here. So if you want, the representation should be the whole thing here and so on. OK, so what we try to do, and then we'll finish with that, is to build something which is much simpler than that with RBMs. So the idea is the following. Yes? Yes, because then that would not remove the possibility that the other ones are correlated with sigma and are giving, uh, have an, here you are really trying to remove everything about sigma and the other ones. So here you have your uh, representation. Yes, yeah, so one more thing about that. The problem is with this is actually it's, it's an it adversarial training problem because you want to minimize the loss, the reconstruction loss under this maximization problem here, uh, maximization, you have to find the best discriminator. You want to be sure that the best discriminator is unable to reconstruct something while minimizing. And it's not also, I mean, it's, it's really well known that this other cell training are very difficult to do, right? Uh, numerically, it's, it's quite tough. So here, what we want to do is having information about the label, sigma, which is concentrated in, in, in a portion of a hidden unit, this one. And that one should be, you, should, you would like to remove the information. So essentially, you would like that the discriminator, which is looking at that, is unable to predict discriminator, unable to predict sigma. But that means the information should be concentrated here. I mean, I'm just speaking in very informal terms here, but you will uh, just trying to explain precisely what that means. So is it clear? So essentially, we would like to have a good RBM, as usual, except that the information about some label, some additional information we have on the data, is really localized here, and this thing has nothing to do with sigma. So you could do exactly the same kind of, uh, of things here, choose discriminators which are very powerful and try to do that. It turns out it's not easy numerically. So what we have done is something which is much simpler and I, I, I finish with that, we say, okay, let's do a discriminator which is very simple and stupid. Let's assume that the discriminator is a perceptron. Okay? So a linear discriminator. Okay, so a linear discriminator is simply trying to predict sigma from the set of H mu's, right? It will build something like that, so exponential, exponential sigma times sum of a mu, a mu, h mu, over one plus the same thing without the sigma, right? So it's gonna be the priority that sigma is zero, or the priority that the sigma is one. If you want the best perceptron to miserably fail, then what you have to do is to make sure that the cloud of points in the, that in, uh, the representation, in the representation space that correspond to label zero, and the one which correspond to label one have the same centers of masses. 
If they have the same center of masses, there is no way you can put a hyperplane to separate them. If they are a little bit disjunct, then you put a hyperplane and it will do something. Maybe not 100% performance, but it will do something. So you have to put them at the same point. So the condition for this to fail and to give one half is that the average value, so th that means the, the center of mass of the H condition to sigma equal one, that should be the same thing for sigma equal zero. Let's say you have one half and one half for the two labels. And that is a condition on the weights. But it's a simple condition. It's a linear condition on the weights. It, it can be expressed as your weight matrix times some vector here is equal to zero. So what you can do is you can do a training where for all these hidden units here, you have additional constraints on the weights. So there is no GAN, nothing. It's much simpler. It's very fast. And you are, it will ensure you that a, a perceptron is unable to predict the label from that. Of course, a, a better discriminator will be able to do something. So you can go to higher order. So for instance, you can have a quadratic things, right? That's, that is better, right? And the same thing here. But then you can impose now a condition that is impossible from the covariances of the H mu and H nu to, to, do the, to do the separation between the two classes. So you want to align the covariance matrix. And now that gives another condition, which is a condition of some kind of quadratic, I mean, some matrix here that should be equal to zero. So it's a harder condition, but still which can be implemented during the learning. So by doing this this way, you can actually remove some information and concentrate the information on soft part of a hidden layer. So that's something we, we have done. I just want, and okay, I will finish because I'm very, very late. So we have done that on MNIST, so I'm not sure it's very useful for MNIST, but I mean, just to show it can work. So you can, for instance, just automatically, so you take MNIST 0 ones, only zeros and ones. So this is the RBMs, kind of RBM I showed you. When you remove, you put a constraint on all, uh, on all weights here, so you just remove the information about the labor with the linear constraint. So here, this is the kind of digits which are generated. They are not something in between zero and ones. That's really bad. Then we remove the constraint on one hidden unit. So all the information about the labels is concentrated here. When you generate digits with this machine, they are comparable to that one. So it's good. It's a good machine again. But then now you can change the value of this hidden unit here, unit. And then you can actually very easily go from zero to ones and sample all the different uh, classes associated to the different labels. We have done that also on um, 2D IZ model, these kind of things, where you can learn, for instance, uh, configuration of a 2D IZ model with the RBM. So here is the magnetization as a function of the inverse temperature, and here you have the heat capacity. Uh, you do that, with, so that's a, that's, a, that's a model, that's the RBM. You show very similar performances when, when you uh, generate configuration from the RBM after the learning. You can re you can apply the linear constraints. For instance, the perceptron is not able to predict the sign of the magnetization. That's a labor. So the model now has zero magnetization, but it still has the correlation length. So you see a peak in the heat capacity. If you apply the quadratic constraint, then you kill everything. And now you remove the constraint, and, but apply them to a large portion of fraction hidden units, but remove on, on some hidden units. Then you find a model which works back. on all the information about correlation length and magnetization is concentrating on a few hidden units. OK. And the interesting question is what is the, the cost for doing that? And we can estimate more or less analytically the cost it takes in order to do this concentration. So there is a loss in local likelihood. It costs something, but that can be uh, more or less computed, some approximation. But you know, in, in big words, that would be how it costs to be able to interpret in an easier way the, the representations. So I think I should stop here. If you have more questions, I'd be happy to, to give you more information about that. And uh, I thank you for, for your attention over the past days. Okay.